space, there is always a certain kind of distance between what's underneath and what's here and what's above. I have just poured a bit of schnapps on the carpet. Unfortunately, it's not sand. But most times, before we start a conversation or before we even start to talk, there are other people listening. There are other people from other generations, our ancestors. There's the air. There are other things beyond, underneath, below. And this is something that most times, as an Ibibio person, you would first pour a bit of schnapps before you start a conversation to connect all these different spaces to be part of this conversation. And of course, as Meshach Gaba is not here, it's a way of also connecting with him, wherever he is, um, to join us in this conversation in one way or the other. Um, but I would hand over the mic to Yvette Mutumba, who would then... Yes. Um, so, yeah, unfortunately, Mesha Gaba couldn't come today. And the reason is that he had to send off his passport to London because he's going to have a show at Tate at the 2nd of July and he needed um, a new visa for England. And so they didn't send back his passport in time. And so he couldn't travel from Holland to Switzerland. And so that's the reason why he couldn't come. And um, we thought actually that is um, something we um, would like also to start the conversation with because obviously this is an aspect or problem that um, a lot of artists, especially now because we are talking about the African continent, but also of course other artists um, face this, that um, the issue of um, visa or borders and that they often can't come to their shows or it is costing lots of money or um, you know, lots of difficulties that actually um, they have to face in terms of their practice and um, what they yeah, want to do or where they want to go. And um, so this is certainly something um, yeah, that is quite prominent for everybody who's working with artists, um, not only living on the continent, but also in diaspora, so just as Metak or as Ottenbong. And you also actually have been facing these problems when you did your performance at Tate. Yeah, um, I think... The, the issues about you know, displacement or about moving from one space to another um, as an artist is also quite difficult if you have to get a visa. And I remember at the Tate, I had to apply two times to get a visa to go to the Tate, even though I've lived in Europe for quite a long time, but I decided to keep my own um, passport and my own nationality. And so just to go to England becomes quite difficult to actually go work and it's becoming more and more difficult. So I can understand that Meshach, in a way, he has a Benin Beninois passport, but then you still have to apply, even though you're a resident in Europe, you still have to apply for a visa to go to England. So I do understand the situation, but unfortunately he's not here, but we'll try to fill the gap. <laughs> fill, it, fill the gap, yeah. So maybe we just move on um, to your work. And as we talked about displacement and diaspora, maybe that's also a good starting point to, to see. I mean, you studied in Nigeria, but then you moved to Paris and studied at the um, Académie des Beaux-Arts for a couple of years. And you've been in different residency programs, so you moved lots around within Europe. And um, so maybe we just start with the question how much this actually affects your artistic practice or whether you feel that should be a part of your practice or not. And then maybe after that, thinking about also the question of clashing cultures or different cultures, because for you, it is still very important to, to go back and to do projects in Nigeria or in other countries. Mm. Um, well, yeah, I'll just start with um, saying that um, it, for, for me, the, the idea of shifting or shifting states or shifting of destination had already started as a child. So um, my, in our family, in my mother, we learned already quite a lot of things that were linked with different places. So you had like books that actually make you displace, make you think of another place. Um, 
piano lessons, um, reading about Don Quixote, um, into reading about also things from books of maybe Chino Achebe. Um, so the possibility of actually having that aspect of displacement already started from childhood from the influences I had and the influences that my mother gave me. So coming to Paris or to study in Paris was just another step of like physically being in another space to be able to maybe understand what you've read or what you have imagined. And the physicality of that space actually kind of makes what you imagine maybe real or not real. Um, so, uh, working in the diaspora and working within the continent is something that happens quite naturally because, in general, I've been in both places and in different places that influences the work. And that is very important that you, one is open to get influences and to challenge also what you believe. And that's what I, I kind of... I'm interested in doing with, the, with my work, that places are, these spaces become spaces of encounter, a space to challenge what I think is real or what I think is true or what is the truth. So that's like the starting point or the beginning of how I think about my work yeah. or, yeah. So this is basically the starting point and then what is really very important is that you do lots of research. I mean, you mm. work like a researcher at a university, so you read a lot, so you travel also to find things in archives mm. and that's like a very important part until it comes to the end product mm. or the work. And so maybe you could also go a bit into that and also because you said now um, it's good for you to be challenged and maybe, you know, to be a bit more uh, specific about that, what, you know, what challenges you or mm. why you decide to become this researcher and reading and um, also challenging your audience with often really very complex work, which is not always easy to, to understand, really. Um, I, I just feel that everything in general is complex. Life on its own is complex. My body on its own is a complex organism. I can't understand everything that happens just within my own space and my own body. Um, the next moment something might change. I can't control it. So that complexity is something that is naturally there. And I don't think things are just one layered. Everything has that multiple complexity in love, in relationship, in, in, in the air we breathe is that complex. So it starts from that um, point that Once you start questioning even a little thing, a piece of paper, what is paper, what is air, what is anything, then you realize that you cannot just start working on one layer because it's so connected to other things and it starts bringing out other questions that you ask that you were not aware of. So with that way of questioning, and it then moves the work into looking at different layers and looking at different possibilities. And so that, of course, then leads into a kind of research, into reading about things, into knowing what was the past, why is it like this now, and where are we going with this? So it's, it's that kind of quest of, of the unknown that seems to trigger where I, I start the work. And the notion of also uh, connectivity, because a lot of times people, we think, oh, think something is happening there, over there. There is maybe um, a flood down south or in, I don't know, in Oklahoma. Or, but at the same time, we know that everything on its own is so connected and interconnected. So even a certain material that we might be using, if we have to break it down to understand what, what does it mean or where is it coming from, then, of course, that aspect opens up layers of connectivity and not from one, con from one continent to another. So it's, these are places that I'm interested in that place of shift and of narratives and of connectivity. Mm. 
and actually you how you I mean you that's how you also um, make it visual in your work because mm. you use ma ma many very different media mm. so you mm. work with drawing you work with video mm. and you work with performance yeah. and maybe we just could come to your um, first work you brought here which was at Tate and um, which also was um, lots of research that you did before and um, you always try to um, yeah, interact also with the audience, I think, which is a very important aspect. So you not only challenge yourself, but you also challenge the audience, um, confronting them with your research or yeah, with the outcomes um, mm. of your ideas. And so mm. maybe you talk a bit. About yeah, I'll, I'll start by talking about this piece that was shown on the 24th of November 2012 at the Tate Tanks, um, Tate Modern. And uh, this was a proposition from the curator Elvira Diangani O'Shea. And she invited um, uh, me and the artist Nastia Mosquito to think about the notion of politics of representation. And um, my first um, uh, intro, well, my first discussion with Elvira was that I am not interested in politics of representation. I believe that when you think about representation or the politics of representation, then that means you're trying to put something into a box. You're trying to fix it and say, OK, this <coughs> is what A is. This is what B is. So I was more interested in the notion of shifting states. So this work um, presented here at um, the Tate Modern was, uh, is a work called Contain Measures of Shifting States. Um, I was looking very much at aspects of nature and how, with nature, how things are constantly shifting. In, in things that are invisible, water going through the ground and we don't see it, um, air, um, infiltration, uh, things actually shifting gradually that we don't see. And so that was more or less the starting point of the notion of representation, because we, once we represent something, it's hard to say we don't see actually the next part, the next shift of things. Um, so if we're talking about identity or we're talking about geology, or then we can't say that everything is in a static state. Everything is constantly moving and constantly f in, in flux. So I thought this could be the best way of like bringing in that notion of flux and shift and influence. And here in the Tate, I showed four tables, which would have to perform for nine hours, because had, I had just nine hours to do this presentation. And each table was in a state of flux. So the first table with the felt and the liquid actually infiltrating. So when you came at 10 o'clock in the morning, you would not see anything happening. So you would have to stay to actually see the stain gradually going in through the, the felt and staining the piece. The second um, table where the lady standing, the one at the bottom, um, is actually liquid falling on a hot plate and becoming smoke. Uh, so. What was interesting about that is that people would actually sit down or wait around the table for about 20 to 30 minutes, watching a drip of the liquid dropping on a hot plate and making smoke. So for me, all the four tables are actually performing, are actually doing an act of something. They never stop acting. They never stop. They're, never in, they're always in constant movement. The third table is um, a table with melt ice, um, ice melting into a glass bowl. Um, and the fourth table was where I was sitting, which, of course, I am also an element, and which talks about it was a place where I could have a conversation with people. There were about 100 images taken of different states of things. So also looking at photography as a state of fixing an image. And so if we imagine a photographic image and we imagine the sequence before or the sequence after, um, what we see as that photographic image might be a lie. Um, so with having 100 images on the table, people could actually make sequences of stories, um, sequences of narratives. And 
most of the time, sometimes I could have a, a whole conversation with people around the table or sometimes an intimate talk with someone else. So um, the notion of shifting was also that what we say to others or our influence or when I meet you or I meet you or you, we're constantly shifting our state of mind and we're renegotiating what it means to be in dialogue or meeting someone. Um, so that's what the, this work was mainly about there. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean, and that's, I mean, it's slowly becoming to another aspect of your work because now you already said that you're always part of your work and so performance is also an important part of your work in that mm -hmm. sense that you, I mean, here it was less performing but more, I mean, the encounter with the audience mm -hmm. and the, uh, yes, the, yeah, the exchange with the audience but, I mean, in other cases it's more about you in the space. I mean, it's also about shifting and moving mm -hmm. but also you in sort of inhabiting a certain or specific space and um, using your body to sort of communicate with this, mm. what, what's around you, mm. right? Yeah, well, the, the, uh, of course, when you are having exhibitions in different places and you have to negotiate how you're working and some works would not fit in a certain context. So um, a lot of times, one, for me, I'm very much interested in where am I showing, what kind of space is it, uh, what is the context around there? Um, and sometimes that also brings in uh, another aspect of how I can work or how I can um, work with the materials or the content that I'm working with. Um, this, this was a piece that was shown here in 2013, I think, in uh, Nashaja Biennale. And since I'm interested in so many mediums, and for me, I think if I'm making a performance, it has to have a reason why it has to exist as a performance. If I have to write a poem, what does it mean to write a poem? Um, the, the way I'm working also determines the kind of materials I'll be working with. And the complexity of the subject then sometimes makes it possible that one can layer different things with the different subject matters I'm interested in. So here at Sharjah, I had visited the place in 2012, December, and, um, and I literally fell in love with the space. So it's something also about an emotion um, in, re in relation to a space that you encounter. And this space had this tree in the middle and I decided that it would be a space for contemplation and to really redesign the space where people can actually come in, sit, and also look at the photographic images that were in the space. Plus there were 13 poems that I wrote that were printed on stones. So the first time I actually worked on the project with printing on stones was in Copenhagen where I was thinking of the notion of the taste of a stone. What does, it mean? what does it mean, the taste of a stone? And I did a work around that that would think about stone as demarcation, stone as an object, as a weapon, stone as a souvenir. Um, so to actually break down what a stone could actually be and what it could be, because we find it everywhere, but we take it for also for granted that it's just there and it's, it's nice or... Um, so that aspect of actually printing on the stone, creating, bringing in stones from the Fujaira Mountains in Sharjah, and people could actually come in and um, sit in there, look at it, read it. The, the images that are actually placed on the ground are images that are linked with other places I had been to that remind me specifically of Sharjah. So in a way, these images, when you look at them, there's something quite familiar, but something quite distant at the same time. So it's another way of like connecting other places that I've been to, other places that have maybe an emotional, I have an emotional attachment towards them, or an aesthetic attachment towards them, or um, a physical uh, connection, and bring them within that space. And the poems kind of gel all these feelings that I had 
within Sharjah and other places. So when you read the poems and see the images, it would then start connecting and making stories within that space. So um, I think, yeah, working in that way, um, of course, then you start questioning how do you deal with different spaces you're going to, how do you deal with the materials that you're going to work with, how do you deal with the emotion of where you're encountering at that point in time. Maybe you could also just come to this, because we saw mm. already the other image, yeah. that you did actually also a performance uh, within this space, mm. using it. Yeah. Using uh, your voice and, yeah. Yeah, the, 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 in, the thing that was, for me, very um, interesting in relation to being in the Middle East was that, of course, in relation to plantation, in relation to plants. And um, I went to one of those shops, and I could find a mango tree, and I could find a papaya tree, and also uh, the plant which is placed on the head uh, is called Queen of the Night. But all this um, elements, so all these plants were actually plants that I grew up with as a kid. So finding it in another space, um, and especially in a place like Dubai or in Sharjah, was quite uh, brought back all these memories. So in a way, the performance that was done here was really uh, a performance that people that was linked with my memory, my encounter, but also people could actually inter um, interact with me. And there were also songs that I made for the plant. And at the same time, thinking of the plants, I made quite some research of where certain plants came from originally. So when you think of this plant, it actually comes from, like the mango tree would actually come from Southeast Asia. But it's everywhere, you find it everywhere in Western Africa and you find it everywhere in Southern America. So you start thinking of the displacement of plants. You start thinking of how things find home. And then I was thinking maybe in the future, this places like Dubai or like Sharjah or the Emirates, which is mainly desert, you know, not much plantation, might be able to even have a, a whole farm of papaya tree to export. So there were all the stories that came into play. And the performance lasted for like nine hours sometimes, where people could actually write things, or I could ask them certain things. And they were also singing. And so, yeah. Yes, and I think um, this is a good example also to come to another body of your work, which is less related with performance, but with objects and um, material culture, because you talked about how you know, these plants reminded you of your memory. Mm. And what you actually did is that you worked with an ethnographic collection um, at the Velkotun Museum for quite some time. Mm. And you did a residency there, and you went into especially the Africa collection. And um, I think there the aspect is really important that people would maybe um, sort of expect you to have a certain connection to these objects, because um, there are many objects from Nigeria and other, other areas in West Africa. But actually, it was not the same like with, you know, just said with the plants that mm. they evoked a certain kind of memory, but it was rather that you found many objects that you were surprised because they are historic objects and you didn't really have any idea what to do with it mm. or you would have, you know, go back and do research mm. and yeah, maybe you could start working about, uh, talking about this. Yeah. Um, the this was in 2011, I think I was invited yeah. uh, to the Welt Kultur and Museum. And normally that's one thing I always said, no way, I'm not going to go into an ethnographic museum. I'm not interested in all these things. But um, I was quite surprised when I went to the Welt Kultur Museum and we, I was invited to do a residency for a month. And so I would just explain a bit about the Vell Culture Museum. They have about 70,000 objects that have been collected from all over the world, from North America, Oceania, uh, um, Middle East, everywhere. And so I was quite interested in this um, collection because they mainly have functional objects, objects that are used, that were used ev for everyday life objects that were used for commerce, objects that were used for um, every, yeah, just like having a cup, just a simple object, nothing 
no mask or things like that. And so I went into the collection and then gradually started looking at objects mainly from Central Western Africa, also going down to South Africa. And I um, encountered a lot of objects that seemed kind of abstract, like for example, this object. Can anybody guess what it could be? Nobody has, anybody? <laughs> um, well, um, it's actually money, it's actually currency. So once the object starts, looks, I mean, it's quite a big shape, it's that, that big. Um, and I started questioning how come this is currency? What does it mean? And so it brings, it takes you back into the past and takes you back into reflecting on how um, currency has changed. What was an exchange? What, what does it mean to exchange different goods? And why was it made in this form? So these were um, things that, like also this one. This one is called uh, Kusu, and it's mainly from um, uh, Congo, the Congo area. And this one is um, actually, as a kid, I knew, the, I knew one of these objects, the small one. It's called Mpogo. It's a Manila. And this was actually imported in the, from, starting from the 16th century from the Portuguese and bringing it into Western Africa as a way of trade, as a way of money. So a hundred of the small Manilas will make the King Manila, the bigger one. And the bigger one was mainly used for storage. So it's like almost like a bank of where you have a lot of money. You could have five of these pieces stored in your room. So I mean, with the um, Welt Kultur Museum, it was interesting to start understanding a bit more a history that I did not know of, and objects that I'd sometimes seen, but I did not know what they meant or what, they, what the implication was in history. And so I did quite a lot of um, research on these objects. And, um, and <laughs> at one point in time, um, these were all the objects that I took pictures of. And the three things I was interested in was mainly metal. So how, uh, what kind of metal, what does it mean, the metal, to use metal at a certain point in time? So most of the objects here are actually currencies in different forms, currencies as normal currency, uh, currency as weapon, uh, currency as jewelry. And so we have to think of these objects, like some of the weapons or throwing knives, as actually the nuclear bomb or the high-powered guns of the 18th century because they were so expensive to make and metal was very hard to extract. So they were quite a number of these metal pieces that were made, but they were very, very expensive to make and owned by very important people. So when we look at it today, we look at it as just objects that are objects. But then when you start looking at the history that is behind it and why it was made and how it was made, then you start realizing how important these objects are in a certain context. So in a way, um, for the museum, I thought, um, or in general, I thought it would be good to make a poster. So I remember in the 80s when I was, as a, as a kid, we had all these posters called almanacs that would have alphabets, like A for apple, B for bird. And this was sometimes what you found in shops and in classrooms as part of a teaching process. And I thought this would be actually good for the museum to have posters that would be part of a kind of educational process within the museum and where people could actually take it with them. And it continues it's to perform in other people's houses. So the person can actually narrate a story to the next person and the next and the next. And the next part of this project will actually be in Lagos where I'll be showing the posters and doing a performance, which will then be, these posters come back again to Lagos. Most of the, the poster was actually made in Lagos in Nigeria. Did I yeah. answer the question? Yeah, yeah, no, I think, um, yes. I mean, it's uh, like a very important aspect that you know, also said that you brought back, you bring it back to Lagos because yeah. it's, you know, there are often these questions about, um, 
you know, especially when you live in the diaspora, you come from a certain African country, that there are certain expectations. And especially now working with an ethnographic collection, as you said, at first you didn't even want to do it, but then you sort of got hooked. And that you go back, because actually over, you know, in Lagos, not also not everybody knows what mm. these kind of objects mm. um, are or represent. And that you can go there also to... Yeah, not to teach, but you know, to, to start a conversation maybe. Yeah, I think, I mean, I studied in Nigeria. I went to school in Nigeria, so I know what I learned and what, um, and a lot of times you don't learn a lot about the next, like someone from like Meshach, he comes from Bena. I don't know much about Bena, even though we're close next to each other. So you don't really know that much that is going on around you. And so I found this interesting that I could actually be within, with objects and that were made by different parts of different groups, um, different nations, and have that put them together in one context under the notion of currency. And so when I, if I, when I go back uh, this October, it's quite interesting to have a group of people where the conversation starts. So it's not only looking at what the books write, but trying to get also the story from the other side. Because there are quite a number of people that of my, fa my father's generation and my grandfather's. grandfather's generation that would actually know specific stories and maybe know names of people that actually made search some of the objects. So it's a way of actually collecting data on both sides. So giving out the posters and having a conversation with people will actually bring in other kind of information that you don't find in books and that you don't find in museums and you don't find in certain areas here and to add that to the whole body of work that is building up. Yeah, I think mm. that's also an important aspect that you feel like that this is like just a starting point in terms of your body of work. Mm. So I think this is not only applying to specifically this residency at the Velkotur mm. Museum, but that you always feel like if you are at a certain place in a certain time or do a residency, then mm. it's something not you do then, but it's something that feeds into like a long-term development of yeah. your artistic research. And that's why or how it becomes so complex and mm. layered with all these different aspects playing mm. in. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Shall we open up for questions? Yes. Uh, Bong, when you perform with this piece that you just showed with the posters, are you like narrating the different objects and you explain stories about them, or how does it exactly work? Oh, you mean for um, when later you in the future? Vegas, for example, to do a performance with it? Is yes. it like, as um, we see in the picture? No, yeah. I think what I'm interested in is that, for example, the, with the posters, um, the problem now is that in the 80s, the almanacs were made a lot in Nigeria, in Lagos. But um, now we don't find the posters anymore. And I don't know if any of you know the posters that have hair styles and um, clothing that you can actually go to the head, headdresser and say, I want this hairstyle or this kind of way of making your dress. Um, and now we are hardly finding that. And we're finding more posters that are showing haircuts of Chris Brown to Bobby Brown to, you know, like American superstars. And, and made in China. So it's like the, the, these posters were actually used at, in the 80s and in the 70s as political statements. They were used as educational purpose objects. Um, and today you don't find this kind of political statements that would actually criticize the government, criticize things that are going on, or used as just everyday um, way of like having a very visual uh, relation instead of a verbal relation, but a visual relation of understanding what the politics of what's going on in that region. So for me, it was interesting to take back these posters and to actually think of the place of where it's actually distributed, which is the marketplace. So within the marketplace, you could have people that are passing by. You could actually have a place where you can sell or give out objects and get information. So the kind of way of perf um, the performance is really dealing with the space of distribution and where 
the, op the posters themselves can be distributed. The posters are a way of like negotiating a conversation. It's a starting point to having an exchange. So that's where I think that performative aspect takes place. And then also in the exhibition space then becomes also another space of negotiation of giving out a poster or do you give out a poster or do you sell it? And why would you sell it? What kind of information are you getting in return? Um, because it's all about also this notion of currency and of currency of information, currency of objects. So it's, I'm thinking of all these different notions, but it's still something in the works and something, uh, of course, when you're in the space, it might change, but these are the starting points of the idea. Um, um, you mentioned when you were approached by the Weltkultur Museum to um, kind of curate parts of the collection and to have a look at it, that you were um, quite reluctant and said, oh, you know, I'm not interested in that kind of, yeah, collection and kind mm. of museum, mm. idea of museum. And mm. um, I was wondering, um, after that now, which is fantastic, I think, um, do you think this is kind of, not the only, but one of the smartest method to work with those kind of collections in the future to, yeah. It's a very complex um, situation, I think. Uh, and I think it's a very difficult position because I think the museums themselves are finding it difficult to position themselves uh, within the context of today. And as an artist, how you also realize how tricky all these objects and how, how all these things have different connotations. And I think the rejection of this was maybe from experience of going to different museums and seeing these objects the way they're displayed and having a complete distance, even though it might be an object that comes from my father's um, backyard, but still I have a certain kind of rejection towards it because all of a sudden, it becomes a kind of empty shell. It takes a status that does not anymore have that aspect of what it is. And, and so that was, the, that was something I battled with. And it was a very difficult um, process to uh, just, because you can't use it. You can't use the object, you, everything, you have to wear gloves. You know, it's like, you can't really do much with it when you know that you would like to just put it around your wrist and feel and feel the object. Mm. So, of course, the notion of museum um, and the space of guarding an object also gives that complexity of like, how do you deal with this object in the future? How do you deal with it with the public? How are you negotiating how people are visualizing or interacting with this object? So these were questions that I placed or I put out there to say, OK, I have a certain kind of resistance towards this. Um, but at the same time, I'm very much interested in it. And why am I interested in it? I'm not interested specifically on the object itself, but I'm interested in what the object does. Um, what, what does it mean in the context of today? How do you give another narrative to something that has been narrated in a certain way? So I think that aspect of being with the objects, because the nice thing was that I could actually sit with the objects 24 hours for one month. Every day, I had the keys, set the alarm off, go into the room, and I could be with an object and sit with it. So sometimes at 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm thinking something is bothering me. I take the key, I go downstairs, I'm with the object. So sometimes what I read about the object is not what I see and then what it should be then becomes something else. So it's, it was a process of understanding why, why is it like this? Why, do, why is it said that this is this? And, and when it should be maybe this? Because you have time to weigh, you have time to feel, you have time to see the marking of what another artist has done to the object. So once you start seeing the traces within the form, you start understanding how and why. Um, so, I hope I answered your question, yeah.
Yeah, my name is Gad Juf. Uh, Hello. From Senegal, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to meet you. Unfortunately, that we don't have brother Gaba. Yeah, here I know. So today. sorry about that. Uh, <coughs> but just uh, what you were explaining about the uh, currency, yes. that object uh, yes. that you have been developing about being something that had a certain value yes. in the previously mm -hmm. and today, which has become a museum object. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you mentioned, it, it was something that was brought from Africa, that was in, a, in Africa, and they took to a museum. Yes. Yeah. And so um, the idea of making this poster that I found very really mm. interesting, so um, what would be the, uh, the idea of making a poster, taking it to Nigeria, and um, show it to people in giving them instruction of what this object used to be or what this object are really um, meaning mm. today. So that is uh, what I don't understand. Or, um, because mostly the profile mm. would just see the object mm. and if there is no clear explanation or mm -hmm. clear information, mm -hmm. as I would say, which is the problem of Africa continent today, is the misinformation mm. to know what is what. Mm. So if you were to take this object mm. from one point, as you say, from mm. a distant point, mm. and bring it back to Africa, mm. and uh, to show it mm. as something that used to be mm. valuable in mm. the African land, mm. so um, what would be behind that story? Well, would it be an art form or something that they could refer to? to have a transition of currency today? Um, I think I will go back to the um, object. We have to also see that a lot of the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the, we can't just look at the objects alone as just coming out of the continent. First of all, there has been a lot of displacement of material. Um, some of it comes from Birmingham, some of it comes from Portugal, some of it comes from Antwerp. And this came in and goes out. So it's not something that has been static and has also has shifted the economy of what African economy is today. So if you think of different currencies, that was constantly negotiated by exchange of material and minerals. So that is something that for me is quite important that it's talking about displacement, it's talking about the shift, why at this point in time we have a certain kind of economy and what it means to be part of the IMF or be part of all these structures which didn't start today, started already in the 16th century of negotiating currencies and negotiating monies and negotiating who has the wealth and where dominance and power takes place. So for me, it's not, if I go back with this, I'm not going back with the objects, I'm going back with the posters, right? Um, within the posters, there are different slots and boxes that have stories. Some of the stories are personal stories. Some of the stories are really referential stories to the object. So as a, someone that takes back this poster, you already have quite a lot of information on each object. You already have um, names of objects that at one point in time, one couldn't find a name for them. So some of them, I even gave them a name, like the bird eye. Um, and explain why I gave it a name. So within that, it doesn't, it's not cryptic. It's something that is very clear, something that has information under every image. Why I bring it back, because I, for me personally, I studied also in Nigeria. <coughs> I, I did uh, a few residents, um, not residents, teaching in Congo, in Kinshasa, um, been to different places and different schools. And I feel that um, the, Coming from that, my, the education I have, there are some things that I'm, I'm still asking questions about. And so I feel that if I have knowledge of something, I also share knowledge. It's, it's just a, another way of bringing in another kind of information, and also I will get knowledge back. So it's another system of exchange. Um, I don't know if I've answered your question or... Um, it's okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. Just make a contribution of this. You know, we are talking about. I was in Nigeria, in Abuja, in 2008, 
for the first summit of uh, Aresova, I think you remember mm. the Aresova summit for the African Regional Summit for Sustaining Art in the Continents and things, and which was uh, um, maybe in the same level of uh, what you planning to do about this poster because we had uh, other artists from the from Nigerian artists and all uh, the West African artists who came in there, yeah. But um, what I was suggesting was um, mostly to have uh, um, an open debate like this um, with the schools and uh, educational, mm. uh, um, educational institute um, for the Africans, especially for the young who are, um, who are learning to mm. have the uh, perspective of this transition of contemporary African arts, meaning and value especially. Yeah, that, that's, I mean, that's a different, another aspect of, you know, there are multiple layers to this thing. It's not all on one level. It's something to build up. It's something to see how to work and if it's necessary to work with it. If people are also interested, do you impose something on people that are not interested in something? Like how I was not interested in looking at these objects or not knowing about the objects. So these are things that you also have to consider the audience you're working with and how you're negotiating that and what you're proposing with that audience. So these are the things that I'm always considering on both sides, how to work with, it's not my, impose, I don't impose what I think should be there. Um, I believe that I would learn a lot from there also, from being there. So I don't feel that I have to teach, but I feel of a one-to-one -one connection. A kid will teach me something and I might be able to teach that kid something. So it's something of like looking at it on that level of a connectivity and exchange than thinking I'm going to educate someone. I don't believe in, in that. Good, okay, thank you. I think it's, <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> it's done. Uh...